Hello and welcome to the Analytics Nexus 2019, the premier virtual event for analytics best practice. This presentation is titled Case Studies in A-B Testing and will be presented by Merit Aho. This is one webinar and a whole series of presentations you have access to beginning today. A few quick housekeeping items before I introduce this particular presentation. At any time, you can interact with this presenter or other presenters with questions or comments on Slack. The Slack address for Analytics Nexus is analyticsnexus.slack.com. And you should have received an email invitation to join if you registered in advance. If you didn't receive that email, you can find an invitation link to the Slack in the menu below, as well as in the resource list. Once you log into Analytics Nexus Slack, you can find the channel for Merit Ajo to engage. Also, you can engage with us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at analytics underscore nexus. Finally, for questions on Analytics Nexus or Clarivine, which is producing this event, feel free to email us at info at clarivine.com. This session will be presented by Merit Ajo. In 2016, Merritt established the marketing optimization and testing team at Dun & Bradstreet, supporting a global portfolio of in-house websites and product groups with focus on improving customer experience, lead generation, and sales funnel metrics. Prior to Dun & Bradstreet, Merritt led analytics and optimization efforts in e-commerce and lead organizations at Volusion and Dell, leading back to 2010 when Merritt entered the field by way of a university analytics competition. Merritt is an eager advocate for analytics and CRO as foundational principles in business and product culture, both internally and externally, as a mentor and regular contributor to industry organizations and events. Merritt, over to you. Hello, thanks for joining the presentation. Uh, so I'm going to get a bit philosophical for just a minute here. Um, I started working in analytics and optimization because I saw that data, which we have in abundance, is it's often a more reliable way of understanding human behavior than intuition is. And you can take, you can take data and manipulate it with, with remarkable ease and derive even more understanding. Now, I get that the data's potential for providing meaningful information, it's, it's limited naturally. But our ability to tap into the potential is, is a function of our own effort, of our creativity, of our intellectual horsepower. And for a guy who grew up playing video games like Mario Brothers, where extra lives and flower power, those are often hidden in plain sight, and they're just waiting for you to explore the right spot. And this line of work was just instantly appealing. Uh, over the years, my understanding of the field of optimization has changed substantially. See, optimization isn't just about using statistics to make decisions. And the goal isn't to churn through as many ideas as possible, you know, programmatically separating wheat and chaff. I think it's clear to most CROs and analysts that a huge distinguisher between themselves and other business folks is we acknowledge humans are really bad at making decisions without the proper use of data. But I don't think it's obvious that the difference is much more about mindset than talent. I mean, the process, the methods, the tactics, these are all critical, but none of those can really be effective within organizations unless they're built on a foundational belief system that human judgment is flawed, it's, it's biased, it's generally unreliable, and, and no one, and I mean no one, is fully immune to this. But we can't overcome these weaknesses by understanding them and taking measures to work effectively around them. So that mental model, it really underlies our process, which looks a bit like this. Um, we research users, we research competitors, we research the industry at large, um, even human beings, right, psychology and consumer behavior, and we use these insights to generate hypotheses. And then we're, we're pretty opportunistic about evaluating these hypotheses and prioritizing um, the ones that we want to move forward with and, and experiment on. And, and we're the agents within the company for bringing them to life. So we claim expertise in a couple different areas, or at least we strive for expertise in a couple areas. Um, and these are identifying opportunities, 
uh, for improvement in, in vetting ideas with principles of minimum viable product and scientific method, and I'd say in facilitating optimal decision making based on an understanding of statistics, of data generally, and human behavior, at least sometimes. Um, we represent this work as a circular process because the work feeds itself. I mean, we learn from each bit of research, from each experiment, and we continually build on the knowledge to do our best to disseminate it throughout the company. Um, this, this has been kind of a long introduction to what are really just some, some vivid examples of this process uh, that we've had in our past, uh, of the process working well and, I don't know, maybe not so well, depending on how you view it. So we'll start with a major site redesign project that we had. Um, this page is what we call a company profile page. Uh, Dun & Bradstreet is a commercial data company, and we have the world's largest database on, on companies. Um, and this, this was just one of our online business directories, kind of like online yellow pages. Uh, millions of pages here, um, five pages per business, uh, you know, lots of traffic coming from Google. Um, and this, this site sat stagnant for a couple of years. It was sort of a cash cow. But eventually, someone in the business saw an untapped potential in the pages and decided, uh, we've got to redesign this. And it's funny, it's, you know, it's tales old as time. It's some, someone saying, look, these pages are terrible. We have to redesign them. Um, I mean, so many redesign projects start because we internally are just tired of what we're seeing. Uh, put in air quotes, terrible, it's a judgment. Um, in this case, like so many others, it's not informed by research. It's, it's, it's taste. It's someone's internal taste at that. So this is where my team stepped in and said, hey, why don't we let users tell us what's wrong, if anything? Well, we're at it. Let's get some better understanding of why users value the pages so much so that we don't, I don't know, toss out the baby with the bathwater. So the redesign project was already moving full steam ahead, and we kind of took a quick and dirty approach to this. Uh, we used a tool called Hotchar to turn out a quick survey to analyze task completion and usability of our traffic. Now, if you haven't used Hotjar and need something easy and cheap or free to do these kind of quick surveys, uh, or to do stuff like heat maps, click maps, web form analysis, uh, funnels, it's a tool that's really worth checking out. I think they've done a great job developing out the feature set. Um, so at the end of our analysis, we actually did feel like we had a decent case for redesign. We learned people had a difficult time locating um, the information they were seeking, even though it was accessible on the pages or within a few clicks. Uh, so we were able to provide our design agency with intelligence about key use cases that we needed to make sure we accommodated and problems that we needed to solve. Uh, of course, other data came into play here. Uh, I mean, we wanted to make sure that we had a sound SEO strategy and that the design would support it, since virtually all the 300,000 visitors came from organic search. So the design agency went back did some design work, came back. The, the designs were beautiful. They were thoughtfully constructed. You know, we gave them a little bit of internal feedback. And maybe they missed the mark a little bit here or there. They went back, did some more designing, and came back. And we were done, right? Uh, yeah, of course not. This would be a terrible case study uh, otherwise. Um, this is where the optimization team uh, jumped on the scene again. Uh, I can tell you, had we not, the, the, the project would have been catastrophic. So instead, we took the designs and we created some rough prototypes, which we conducted usability testing on with usertesting.com, which is another fantastic tool, but, um, but not a cheap one. So this, was, this is not uh, a one and done kind of exercise. Um, it's much, much cheaper to test, usability test, to tweak your design and then to retest on prototypes than it is to make changes after development has taken place. Um, in this case, the usability testing it affirmed the design that we were moving forward with, that we, that we were going in the right direction, but it also really helped us course correct for some egregious mistakes in the design. Um, but after this process started the long and arduous development work. Again, the optimi optimization team stuck its nose in. So we campaigned for both the time and the capability to A-B test the rollout. 
uh, which was something other stakeholders were resistant to because of the aggressive launch schedule and, and because it was something they'd never done before at this kind of scale. Um, the test plan we landed on, I can't, I can't say it was elegant. Uh, we tried a beta-like invitation for the new pages. Uh, that didn't work. But we settled on a JavaScript-based redirect, uh, which if you've ever done before, again, is not ideal. It, it results in longer load times um, and some of that flicker potential that um, that you sometimes see with JavaScript-based A-B testing. Uh, we also couldn't just launch the test with a fixed sample and walk away until it was finished like uh, um, some A-B testers will often recommend you do. Uh, I mean, the scale of this thing, right, the risk involved, it, it called for daily vigilance. Um, and it also called for some guardrail metrics uh, that we had to put in place to um, help us make a data-driven decision should things uh, go exceptionally well or, you know, exceptionally poorly. Again, we just, we just couldn't afford to wait for a sample size to tell us that things were failing all the time. Um, but if you're familiar with a guy named Georgi Georgiev, uh, who's provided quite a few different calculators and tools for A-B testing, uh, he's developed this method called Agile Testing Method. And it's sort of a combined Bayesian and frequentist uh, statistical model. And we attempted something similar. Uh, I have to admit, none of us are as good at stats as Georgie, um, but uh, we did our best here. Um, so hoping for the best, expecting the worst, we were prepared to take swift action. So we got a team together. We called it a tiger team. And it was all the people that um, could act on um, information should the need arise, could act swiftly without having to follow some you know, waterfall of communications. Uh, and we met daily and we reviewed the metrics together. Um, turns out, uh, you know, the concern was not necessary. Um, almost from the beginning, the test killed it. I mean, it killed it in a way that I personally had not expected in my wildest dreams. Um, the orange line here is the test recipe, the blue line is the control recipe, and the delta between the two just continued to widen throughout the test. I mean, what's more, even after we fully implemented the new design, that increase in conversion rate held. Uh, we didn't see any regression to mean, which is what you sometimes see from a winning design after it's implemented. Uh, over time, that benefit diminishes. Um, no, months after um, we ran the test, we were still seeing over a 30% increase in conversion rate compared to the old pages. I mean, even Google came around to the, to the changes and really liked them over time. It took a little bit longer to boost our organic traffic, but eventually we saw a 10% increase in that as well. So this was this is a poster child of, of our process. Uh, you know, you, you, you can't expect more success in the most disciplined uh, optimization methodology. Um, but you know we did we did everything right here. We used research to inform our design. We we did rigorous um, iterations of usability testing and, and design changes, um, and then we A/B tested the rollout. We were prepared for any scenario to happen, prepared to take swift action. Um, I, I, but this just doesn't it doesn't happen normally, and that's one of the reasons why this was such a smashing success. I mean, we really couldn't have expected more. Um, it validated our methods, it validated our models, um, but I will say we've had plenty of counterexamples before and since. Um, but even these, I think, have provided us good opportunities to learn and improve. So I'm reminded of this great uh, video that could only have been produced in our age of internet virality. Um, I would say that researching user experience, whether um, clickstream data, surveys, usability testing, it can be a bit like the interaction portrayed here. So sometimes users don't actually know what the problem is. Uh, likewise, sometimes we, as we're trying to interpret the user's uh, feedback, we miss the point of what they're trying to say to us. I mean, the, the truth sometimes lies between the two. Sometimes it's, it's nebulous or nuanced. I think of when a user says something like, oh, this page is too long. And what does that mean? Really, what does that mean? There are, there are thriving blogs out there with posts that take an hour or more to read. And people will do it. They'll go through the entire thing word for word. 
So when a user tells you that your page is too long or has too much content, how do you interpret that? What do you, what do, you do about it? I tend to think that what they're saying is you're just not communicating very well uh, or your, your, your page is not engaging or your, your, your content is just not good. Um, but you shouldn't just go slicing content from the page, uh, although we have, we have tried this sort of thing and uh, you know, it didn't work. Another example, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the term robo-dialing. Uh, you've probably been the victim of it. It's not pleasant. So your cell phone rings from an unknown number, sometimes in your area code. You pick it up, machine starts talking to you, asking you to press one to connect you with some shady salesperson. Um, so our legal team came to us and insisted that we include robo-dial disclaimers on our form legal leads. Uh, of course, it didn't seem to matter that we don't actually engage in the practice, uh, but the potential to do so seemed to be risky enough. I mean, lawyers are terrible marketers, right? And uh, I would hope that they realize that. It was no surprise that the next time we conducted usability testing on the form, someone picked up on it uh, and expressed some serious concern that, um, that they wouldn't be willing to opt into such practices. By the way, if you're interested, the podcast Reply All just did an episode about robodialing, which was, uh, it was illuminating. Um, as it turns out, there may have actually been some method to our lawyer's madness, um, but I think the legal situation has changed since then. Anyways, I've always subscribed to the ideology that at least sometimes it's better to beg forgiveness than ask permission. Um, I will say that often shortens our test execution timeline considerably. So we ran an A-B test, removing the alarmist legal jargon from the form. The results were, look, so it, it can be difficult to be truly ambivalent about test outcomes, uh, to keep your ego out of the picture. Uh, I get that failing to do so, it can lead to really bad habits and even shoddy analysis. Given that, I can't tell you that I wasn't disappointed to find that few people even saw the legalese, and for those, the robodial language didn't appear to make a difference. Now, I won't ever tell our legal team about this, um, but it's true. Let's talk about chat for a minute. So we use proactive chat invitations. These tend to draw a lot of hate, probably more internally than even, than even externally. And it's one of those things that really require you to balance the efficacy of having pop-ups with the experience that, uh, that customers have and their sentiment about that experience. Um, so our team in inherited this website from a different business unit, and after running some surveys and doing some usability testing, we learned that we were causing quite a bit of frustration for some people popping up invitations, it, it, literally every 30 seconds, potentially indefinitely. Um, but addressing these frustrations was really difficult. Our sales team was dependent on retaining chat volume. They really weren't comfortable with any decrease in their leads. So we uh, started testing out um, different options. First, we tried extending the interval to first pop up and the time in between uh, to 60 seconds and 90 seconds, respectively. Uh, we saw a big drop in invites. Uh, we also saw a small drop in chat volume. Um, but in this case, we also saw something called sample ratio mismatch, which uh, means that for some reason the testing engine did not randomly distribute traffic across the recipes, uh, which makes the resulting test data unreliable. Um, but we thought we were probably pretty close to something viable uh, that would address the problem, and so we continued to iterate. In, in our next test, we tried a slightly different tack. This time we limited pop-ups to once per page view. Now this actually had a huge decrease in imitation volume, but it also had a much more sizable decrease in chats. So we kind of went back to the drawing board. In the next iteration, we thought, okay, maybe, maybe it's more about the perception of disruption. And so maybe if we move the chat imitation to the bottom right corner of the screen, it would alleviate some of that frustration. Uh, sadly, this was even worse for chat volume. Um, but finally, you know, we thought maybe we're, maybe we're not doing it enough here. Uh, maybe we're misinterpreting the feedback that we've received. So uh, we firmly believed that 
our chat experience was suboptimal, but simply reducing the pop-ups was not the answer. Instead, we started from the ground up. We redesigned the invitation completely. We gave it a new look and feel. We tried to make it seem more like a chat conversation had already begun. Uh, we added a human element. We made the chat prompts that uh, appear within that window. We made them contextually relevant to the area of the site in which they appeared. Um, and we, of course, reduced the frequency of appearance. Uh, but we even moved the location to the bottom right place uh, again because this looks more like a chat itself, we wanted to put it where chat overlays usually appear on websites. So this combination finally worked. 15% fewer invitations yielded a 12% increase in lead volume, and that increase was driven primarily by chats. So what are we to conclude from this? Uh, is it that user research is too difficult to interpret to be reliable? I mean, are we better off like sticking to tried and true industry norms and best practices? Uh, spoiler alert, I think the answer to that is no, um, but I do have some thoughts on this. First off, I think it's important to look at best practices. They're, they're simply ideas with higher win rates than average. And what do I mean by that? Average win rates in experimentation land run somewhere between 10% on a highly optimized site to maybe 30% no, on average. Okay, so what's the win rate of these so-called best practices? A better than average might just be 40%, 50%. So what, a coin flip or worse? We've got to be really careful about how we treat these. Um, I personally have seen ample evidence of failure with so-called best practices. So going through a couple of those failures. Um, look, starting here, if you're not worried about the amount of information about yourself that's available for purchase out in the world, then you probably live a life of blissful ignorance. And I envy you that. But I will say, just because anonymous visitor targeting is kind of disturbing to most rational humans, it doesn't mean we aren't happier when it, gives us, uh, when it saves us effort and gives us more time. So we found this true on several occasions. Um, maybe I'm a bit partial because we use our own Dun & Bradstreet visitor intelligence technology to do this, but there are really a lot of options out there um, to do anonymous visitor targeting. Uh, we've seen upwards of 17% conversion lift on our forms when pre-filling with IP and third-party cookie sniffing data. Uh, we've had match rates well above 30%, uh, and that makes it a pretty valuable piece of our tech stack. So you've probably heard that more form fields equates to fewer conversions. Uh, I've heard this one a lot. Um, generally speaking, I agree with that, but I would say that exceptions abound. Um, for example, adding, removing a comment box, a job title, business ownership, all these fields on the left, this had a negligible impact on our form throughput. However, removing company name, address, and zip code had a dramatic impact. I think there's probably some fundamental difference between the data on the left that you see and the data on the right. The data on the right, um, well, maybe not personally identifying um, because it's your company address and company zip code, it could be used to make contact and it could result in junk mail or even worse. Um, but I've also seen the removal of more trivial fields impact conversion rates. Uh, bottom line here, you can't assume one way or the other. You should always test before adding fields to your form or before expecting conversion benefit from removing them. I get the sense from a lot of people in the industry that there are certain types of tests, like simple copy tests, that are for newbies. The, you know, people who lack skill or vision to take on more complex projects. As if there were some like threshold of complexity and development effort uh, that were required to demonstrate that you're, you know, a professional uh, in CRO. Um, I can only say I hope some of those snobs um, are employed among our competitors, because we've seen a dramatic performance differences come from, you know, seemingly simple changes in copy. Um, in some cases, as with uh, request callback, which you see on the right here, we've had to learn that the hard way. So someone in our org was so confident in that language that the change went out untested. 
with catastrophic consequences. We clawed our way back tooth and nail from an 85% decline in form submissions. Yeah, 85% decline. That hurt bad. So uh, don't make changes. The, uh, the, the, the learning here is don't make changes uh, to copy thinking that it's, it's trivial in nature. Uh, those can have quite a big impact. I will say it's not just pain that you avoid by challenging some conventions. Sometimes it's a big opportunity cost. Um, this is a case for us with multi-step forms. We'd even been burned before with some failed tests with multi-step forms. We've even um, done some usability testing and gotten negative user feedback about the hassle of multiple steps or maybe it seeming disingenuous to, um, to hide additional fields behind, a, 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 behind another click. Um, in this instance, though, we made sure there was a good reason for the multiple steps. So one of our products that's in the same product portfolio as that anonymous visitor intelligence product, it enables us to match company data to email domain names using an API lookup. Um, and that lookup returns data about that company. And when we implemented this and used the data to match, the data that matched to pre-fill form fields, we actually saw a 15% conversion increase, um, which we validated on multiple websites. So th this was not just a huge win from a product validation perspective, but for our own marketing and for the user experience, this is big. So I will say, I don't want to give the wrong impression here. I'm not, I'm not really trying to like poo-poo best practices, but I do think it's kind of a misnomer, right? So who's it best for? Best on average? I don't know if that's even true. Um, but there are some folks who are doing some great work here to, to kind of um, dispel uh, the mystery. So folks like Jacob Blanowski with his website, goodui.org, where he's trying to put some tangible parameters around best practices and how broadly they apply or how likely they'll be to work in a given situation. It's worth checking out again. I mean, at the end of the day, I just... I don't think there's a single silver bullet that will guarantee you make the best decision every time. The, the way you validate ideas is important. Um, that you validate ideas is important. Which ideas you choose to work on and prioritize and, and where you source them from, I, these are all important things. Um, you've got to assimilate and apply the things that you learn to your future work and, and, and keep a library of information so that you're continually moving forward. It's a process of fine-tuning, and you know, it's really what optimization is all about. So if you've ever listened to the podcast Digital Analytics Power Hour, which if you haven't, I strongly recommend that you do, you've heard Michael Helbling say, keep analyzing. Uh, I'd like to piggyback on that and take it a step further. Keep optimizing. Uh, thank you for your time today. I'd welcome your questions. Thank you, Merritt, for, this, for sharing this material. This has been an extremely enlightening presentation. Just a reminder to our guests, you can engage Merritt Aho with questions or comments at his Slack channel on the Analytics Nexus Slack. Thanks again.